I've been getting this question a lot. What types of businesses should I be buying? What are the best businesses to buy in 2024? Fear not, because in today's video, I'm going to go over the, the top seven criteria I look at as a business broker to determine the best businesses to buy in what industries. And stay till the end, because I'm going to give you my recommendation for the top five businesses that I think are going to be the most profitable in 2024. Let's get to it. Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. I am your host, Leo Landaverde, business broker and commercial lender, helping you buy and scale a profitable business. If you are a small business owner looking to increase your wealth or an employee or W2 executive looking to leave the rat race behind, you are in the right place. Please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to hit the bell and you'll be notified every Thursday when new videos come out. Hey, first, let's talk about the top seven criteria that I look at for the, to make a business worth buying and as a result, one of the best businesses to buy in 2024. Number one, availability, resale, and roll-up opportunities. So you want to go after industries with a large footprint, but not entirely consolidated, kind of a cottage industry, uh, where there is a large availability of players, but not a ton of big players yet. Uh, why? Because you wanna, you can go potentially by doing a roll-up. You do a platform, you buy a platform company, you stabilize it, you brand it, and then you add on other, you bolt on other businesses like for like, similar businesses that you can add. So you can grow, so you can buy it at three times uh, seller discretionary earnings, but then you can sell it for seven times EBITDA when you t when, by the time you're done building it up. That's a great strategy. So um, simply speaking, the more businesses that operate in a specific industry, the more opportunity there is in the space. If the business is so unique that nobody else is doing it, don't get out. You shouldn't be looking at a business like that because you won't have a resale opportunity. What happens after 10 years you've been operating a business and there's not a market for it, then you won't be able to sell it. It has to be a pretty good size. I would say in particular, if your goal is to do a roll up, to buy one platform company and add on a few, you should be focusing on industries that have at least 25,000 or more companies across the US. That's a good size that tells me that is an industry that is stable, that is growing, and that has resale opportunities or roll up opportunities. Number two, barriers of entry with defensible positions. Now, here are the things that you look at. If there is a business that has no barrier of entry, then as a result, everybody will be doing it. That's what happens with uh, for sale by Amazon and all of those things that there's, you need no money and you'll be up and running in no time. That's actually a bad thing for you, what you're trying to do. If you want to buy an existing business, you want to have a business that has some barriers of entry. What are some of those? Licensing requirements, um, shortage of talent, there's a specific type of talent that you need to operate this business that there's just, there's not a ton of it. So you have to train them, which means it's a retention tool. You teach them how to do it. You can take them off the streets, but you have to teach them. There is a shortage of talent for that type. That's, that's, a, that's a thing that, that should be an indicator that those people are requested elsewhere. They are in demand, which means that it's good for your business because that industry is happening. Um, access to distribution channels and high levels of capital expenditures. What does that mean? So, um, access to distribution channels. If there are already things that are set up, distribution channels that are actually helping the industry to actually help you get to where you want to go. And more importantly, uh, high levels of capital expenditures. A business that consumes, that has no assets, for one thing, it's going to be a problem because everybody can do it. If, 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 if it requires no money to operate and you have to invest in anything, well, everybody's going to be doing it, which means it's going to drive the price down. It's going to commoditize the kind of industry that you want to get into. That's a no-no. So you want to have some defensible uh, the, uh, barriers of entry. So for instance, with that, with the licensing requirements, the shortage of talent, the access to distribution channels and high levels of capital expenditures, that's how you can keep the pegs in the global players aware. PEG, P-E-G stands for private equity groups, which are gobbling up a lot of these cottage industries with lower barriers of entries, and they're, they're turning it into massive um, roll-ups, 
And what they do is they drive the price down and, and drive the little guys out of business. Not a good thing for you if you're trying to get into the industry. So I hope that helps. Um, and a little bit on capital expenditures. What are capital expenditures? Those come from the balance sheet. For instance, if you need to buy equipment, machinery, uh, assets that, that are going to be depreciated over time that you need to, do the, to, to be able to perform the work that is required for you to create the revenue, that's actually a good thing because as a side effect of having assets, you can actually leverage those with capital. It is much more convenient for a lender to, if we're trying to buy a business where there is asset heavy that are going to be able to leverage some of that into a loan so you actually pledge assets within the business that I can help you collateralize so you can get a loan. So it's good for two reasons, right? It's good for because you actually need the capital expenditures, which is, limits people from getting into the industry. And you can actually collateralize those assets that you purchase with the capital expenditures. Hopefully that makes sense. Number three, recession proof or recession resistant. Well, I've gone over this and we just came from, we're in the tail end of COVID, 2020 and 2021 with COVID years. And that proved that a lot of businesses were not ready and it were more of a luxury to have. So I call these types of businesses, I'm sorry, if you're gonna be in any business, you wanna be in the pain business versus the vitamin business. You, this is probably going to sound familiar to some of you who have watched some of my videos before. I like pain businesses because there is pain associated with it. You, the, the consumer, the person purchasing those services, has no choice. There is a pain that they have and they have to solve it. What, how likely are you are to take medication that is prescribed by the doctor versus taking vitamins? You may forget your vitamins and you're not going to immediately die. You may, you may not be as healthy, but you're not going to die. If you don't take your pain medication, you may end up dying of pain or with some other collateral damage that you're going to have. So I equate pain to recession-proof or recession-resistant type of businesses. Why? Recession-resistant businesses um, have several specific categories, uh, things in common. One, they produce goods and services that are neither whether the economy is strong or weak. It doesn't matter what's happening in the economy, so geopolitical, socioeconomical, it doesn't matter. People need that. They need to consume those services. Uh, for instance, food, healthcare, and shelter. People need to, regardless of who wins the, the, the election, the, the, you know, the, the presidential election, people have a place to live. They need to, if you have a place to live, they're going to need to have things fixed on their place to live. Uh, where they, they're going to spend no matter what has happening outside uh, versus the businesses that were depending on tourism and then COVID hit and nobody could travel, those were out of business. Another thing regarding recession is that they don't rely on consumer optimism. Think about it. If the, if the market conditions are not doing well, consumer optimism goes down. As a result, people are less likely to spend on something. For instance, luxury goods, handbags, vacations, um, luxury yachts, private planes, etc. The economy is not doing well. You're not going to invest in those. Also, recession-proof businesses are nimble in their ability to shift business models or product offerings to suit the demands based on the economic downturn. They don't require major retraining or acquisition of assets. Um, and lastly, as far as recession proves, they have the ability to scale their workforce up and down as needed. Because when you're a small business in an industry that is pain-related recession proof, you can actually, you know, you can make your uh, staffing, your, your uh, human assets uh, variable. So they go up and down with revenue and to meet the demand. So you can actually have some flexibility with it. But this is a myth, right? A lot of people think that your uh, payroll expenses are fixed and they don't change unless you lay people off. That is not true. You can make your, your payroll expenses variable, which means that they can go up and down with revenue if that's what you need to do to stay ahead of an economic downturn. All right, so far we've discussed three of them. Uh, now we're going to go to the fourth one. Number four, asset heaviness. What is at, I alluded to it when I was talking a little bit earlier about capital expenditure. Assets are really what makes up in the balance sheet. What is your balance sheet, which is the most important financial document that you're going to be examining for the business you're going to buy, is your assets equals liability plus equity, right? Assets minus liability, no liabilities, is going to be all equity. 
So what do assets produce in a business? They produce depreciation, which is a way for you to be able to take advantage of lowering your taxable income by taking the depreciation or the usable life of any given asset and expense it every year. So when you buy a business that has significant assets, you are legally able to step up the value of those assets on your own balance sheet. Are you stuck in trying to figure out how to buy a business? I can help you. All we need to do is connect. I need to understand your situation, ask you a few questions, and give you some guidance. It'll be a complimentary call. If you want to do that, please connect with me. You can send me an email. My email address will be up here, or you can actually drop me a comment and we'll connect from there. Let's get to it. Let's work together thus allowing significant tax mitigation for you. And when you're buying a business that is doing three to four to 500,000 instead of this net income, you're gonna need those depreciation to help you lower your tax bill. If you're buying an S Corp or an LLC, you're gonna have those, that net income for the business is gonna turn into K1s, which means that you're gonna roll up to your 1040s in your personal tax returns. So this is not a tax conversation, but just to tell you how that works. Also, another side benefit of asset heaviness is going to be financing. Lenders love assets. The lenders love to have those assets pledged against the loan, which makes you a better buyer. When you have no assets and then you're just buying the cash flow, that doesn't mean you're not going to get an SBA loan, but it makes some lenders a little more skewed towards asset heavy businesses. So when you're looking at a balance sheet, you want to see assets, you want to see equipment, you want to see fixtures, furniture, and equipment. You want to see things that are used to generate the revenue. They want to be sitting in the balance sheet. They're going to be starting to depreciate over time. And it's okay if they're fully depreciated assets. Barrier of entry. So think about it. If a business requires assets to be purchased as a result less people are going to be le- more people are going to be less likely to invest which means you're going to have less competition if the barrier of entry is higher because you have to purchase those assets if a business requires significant investments in assets it can redu- reduce the number of potential competitors it keeps the competition low because nobody can afford to get in which is a good thing for you if you're already in that industry so that's four Five, high net profit margin. That's all that needs to be said. You know, you don't really want to buy a business that is losing money. So you want to be looking at businesses that are producing at least 10%, if not 15% or up to 20% worth of EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Those are the kinds of business that you're looking at. Um, High net profit. You have to have so much high margin that it has to make the debt service coverage ratio problem obsolete. If you have twice the cash flow of a business servicing the debt, lenders are going to be throwing money your way, which is something that we, this, are the, this is exactly what we discussed inside of our mastermind, inside of our community. If you want to know more about it, reach out to me, Business Acquisition Master, which is a program that we have. It's a community that we have for people who are serious about buying a business. And we go into this in a, a lot of greater length than I do in these videos. Six, high customer lifetime value. It is important to consider that the lifespan of a customer when, you ha- when you're in the paying businesses, customers tend to stick around a little longer. So if, a, if for instance, I'm going to give you an example, in an HVAC situation, you know, if, you work, if you're looking at an HVAC business um, and then somebody may not need a heating or air conditioning unit for seven years, but when they do, they're going to spend 10000 on it. That is factored into the life cycle of a, of a customer. The more they spend on average per year, the better. There are some industries where they just, they just don't spend enough to warrant. You should be looking at at least $1,000 per year spent per customer. That's a metric. That's a key performance indicator you should be looking at. And the businesses that are going to tell you if you stay till the end all have the past the seven point criteria. So the high, you want businesses that are being, um, you, you want customers that are gonna be around for years to come, anywhere from seven to 12 years. On average, they're gonna stay with you because you're gonna be able to, think about it, if you're able to spend $1,000 to acquire a customer that is gonna produce $12,000 lifetime value, what is the return on ad spend on that particular situation? It's 12 to one. Okay, so high customer uh, lifetime value and 
last but not least, demographics and seasonality. This is number seven, okay? Now, there is a trend going on that if you haven't spotted by now, then you haven't been paying attention, and that is the baby boomers are, are an incredibly large group of people that were born right after World War II who are all aging. They're aging out of the market, and they have a lot of needs and a ton of disposable cash. They have money to spend. If you have a business that directly services their needs, it can be a big windfall for you if you're in the receiving end of those service requests. Um, seasonality, right? It's important to understand that seasonality. Um, if you're looking at certain business in certain climates, they may need more of those services than not. If somebody is actually consuming a lot of the services because of the weather, it's a good thing for you. Moreover, uh, you don't want it to be too much of extreme weather for them to need you. If it is too hot or too cold, well, that is going to isolate the, you know, the more temperate climates like California and, and the West Coast, right? You shouldn't rely too much on the weather, but the weather does help in some of these industries that I'm going to talk about. Waited long enough. Here are the top five businesses you should be looking at to buy in 2024. Number one, HVAC. The demand for heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration is at an all-time high and has remained consistent throughout before COVID and post-COVID. There is a short, as a short supply, there is a shortness of the of supply of residential units and commercial. There is people are there's not enough real estate units to accommodate the ever-growing demand, which means that if you have a home, you're gonna need HVAC people. Um, they are consistently on demand and it fulfills all of the seven requirements that I told you. I have HVAC customers that cannot retain, the, they're always hiring those top uh, employees just because there's a huge demand. The demand drives everything. If there is a demand for those services, HVAC is one of them. So listen to this. The industry definitely passes the resilient test um, given that even in the most difficult times, People still need to, if, if, if it is 30 degrees outside and your heater doesn't work, do you have a choice but not to call the, you know, the people to fix it, the HVAC and, and heating and air conditioning, right? You don't have a choice. You don't want to be too cold. You don't want to be too hot. In the summer, right, if it is too hot outside and your AC unit breaks down, guess what happens? You're going to be calling an HVAC person. So the overall industry has a projective um, Compound annual grade, uh, growth rate of 6%, which is huge. So it's expected to continue to grow in years to come. So HVAC is number one. Number two, plumbing. So I already told you. So, so you're going to start to th see a theme. These are services, the service, the home that you're in, right? I just told you that we have the, one of the largest shortages of home building in the U.S., and we're just trying to catch up from the, all the, stop, uh, the stoppage that we had during COVID that no units were built. Now we're building, but we cannot keep up with the demand of people wanting properties. As a result, they're going to need plumbing. The, um, there are a number of factors to consider. I mean, it's growing in every way. Um, the plumbers, the residential and commercial plumbers cannot keep up with the demand. So thus, it's creating this accelerated rate of hiring and training people to become plumbers. You don't need a college degree to be a plumber, which means you don't need a college degree to hire a plumber. They just need to be qualified, and a lot of them are licensed. And notice that both HVAC and plumbing need have licensing requirements, which unto itself is a barrier of entry. The plumbing and fixtures market is expected to grow by $5.4 billion in the next four years with a compound annual growth rate of over 6% as well. So in tandem with HVAC. So number three, roofing. There are approximately 10 and a half million homes where being bought by the millennials between 20 and 31 years old, those millennials are actually buying homes. Now, this is only aggravating the problem of a short supply of homes that we have. There are more people wanting to buy a home than there are those who are willing to sell a home, which is creating this great problem to have if you're trying to tap into this trend. The trend is your friend. Roofing. Think about it. You have all this houses that need roofing and roofing ain't cheap if you want to i have 
roofing in my properties multiple times and it can set you back as a homeowner anywhere from 12 to 20,000 and beyond and you have to have a roof done every 15 to 20 years. So think about it, right? Do you have a choice if there is a roof leak? No, you're gonna have to have not only roof replacement, but roof maintenance. It is in the pain vein, in the pain business. Again, so you wanna be in the pain business. People have no choice but to purchase these services. So roofing is number three. Number four, electricians. So you have your HVAC technician coming into your home, you have your plumber coming into your home, you have your roofer coming into your home, and you're gonna have your electricians. Do you have a choice if an electrical outlet blows up or your, your fuse box goes out and you don't know how to fix it? You're going to need a licensed electrician to come and fix it. There is an ever-increasing demand for electricians. I work with several electrical companies in my accounting practice. And let me tell you, we can hardly keep up with the growth. The industry, even though the industry is struggling with a shortage of qualified workers, that's not stopping the demand. So we eventually we are going to compensate as the demand continues to be. We're going to create a supply of workers to create those. So that's a really good problem to have. The U.S. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates that this industry, the electricians industry, is going to grow by 9% between 2022 and 2032. So think about it. 10% compound rate of growth in this industry for the next 10 years. So the increase is in tandem with the rise in residential electrical permits, up 31% since COVID. To so pay attention to that. And last but not least, what makes up about the top five businesses for you to look into 2024 is home restoration and remediation. Currently, the restoration industry is worth about $210 billion in spend per year. So there are new technologies that are sort of a, um, being added in you know, this, this uh, increasing intensity of natural disasters, storms, flood, and wildfires across the U.S. All you have to, it seems like every time you turn on the news, there is some type of fire, flood damage, or something. That is the home restoration and remediation industry. It's a $210 billion industry. This is coupled with the fact that the age of homes in the U the, the, the infrastructure in the U.S. for homes and highways is, you know, it's aging in place, which means it's going to need more remediation than not. The, the home restoration and remediation industry is expected to continue to grow in 2024 and beyond, driven by factors like national disasters, aging infrastructure, increased awareness of property maintenance. And, and you have to deal with home restoration if you ever hope to sell your home as a seller. There are things that you're going to have to do. You won't be able to sell your house if there is flood damage, if there is mold, anything, anything that has to be remediated. It will be a condition for, the, for you to satisfy, for you to sell your home. So if you want to do that, that's pain. You, need, you can live in an unlivable home, so you have to deal with that. It's a huge industry. So those are my top five businesses to buy in 2024. And you can tell I am excited about it. Hope you enjoyed this video. For a limited time, I'm giving away my cash flow calculator and my buyer's checklist. These two documents together have been downloaded thousands of times. They're great if you are actually actively looking to buy a business. These are tools you need to have to analyze deals and know exactly how to position yourself as a buyer when buying a business. Those are yours to have. All you have to do is click on the links below and they're yours to have. Thank you so much.